Welcome to Wasa Distance Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I'm Ronwin State Slate. Bojo. If you'd like to participate live today, you can call the Wasa Studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM or on the television at Bell Express View Channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available from your teacher and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled from three till four on Monday through Thursday. And we are wrapping up our fifth week of our nine week course. At this point, you definitely should be submitting work for grading in order to be on track for getting your credit done this year. The key questions are the questions to submit for me to mark. They are listed at the end of each of your IL lesson. So you received a package from WASA along with your workbook and the, which questions that we'd like you to answer that are in your workbook, that all the questions are listed at the end of your IL lesson. So you need to do all of them. Some of them are check your understanding questions within the chapter. There are a few activities throughout the course and then the rest are review questions at the end of the chapters in your workbook. So please show all of your work, your steps, your thinking, explain what it is that you are meaning. Give me full sentences, not just one or two words. Really make sure you're communicating your understanding. Also make sure that you are actually answering the question and not just talking on the topic, but that you're actually hitting the points that make sense that the question's asking about. You can do this by hand or electronically. If you'd like to write in your work workbook, that is fine with me. It is your consumable product, so it's yours to keep. And if you'd like to write in it, even though there's not a lot of space, you do what makes most sense for you. Uh, you can also send me an electronic file. If you're gonna do that, Word and Google Docs are the easiest ones for me to open. Everyone has access to Google Docs through their NNEC email address. But if you're going to use a different program, I'm sure that's probably fine. Just let me know so that we can make sure that I can open it, even if I need to convert it or something, just so that we're making sure that I have access to what your, your work. There are three methods for submitting your work. So the first, if you do it by hand, then you can scan it. Or either way, you can send it electronically. Uh, if you're scanning your work, you can do it through a smart device. So if you have an iPhone, or an Apple device, you can use the Notes app. Or if you have an Android or Google uh, Android device, then you can send it through the Google Drive app. Both of them have scan functions that are fairly straightforward. If you need help, I'm happy to walk you through it. If you'd prefer to send a picture just because it doesn't work or you don't have access to those programs, that's fine too. Those files are just a slightly bigger, which will mean a little bit, they might be a little bit more challenging to send, but it's generally it's fine uh, either way. Then you can send it to me through email at studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cc it to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. Or you can also send it to me through Facebook. My name is B. Slate Waza. The second method is to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout. So we have an outdoor mailbox at 74 Front Street we're the bright red building next to the post office. And we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. Finally, the third method is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. At this point, as we are halfway through the course, it's really important to send in some work. Don't wait until the very last minute. Uh, then I can't get your work back to you in order for you to be able to do your final project. So it's better to send me any of the work that you have finished, having a, a full lesson done, send whatever full lessons you have done to me so that I can mark them and get them back to you so that you can use them for your final project. So you need to get those done well in advance of June 10th, 10th if you're waiting till the last minute. You may run out of time and not be able to complete the course because you don't have the your work back in order to do your final project. If you would like to connect with me on social media, my Facebook and my YouTube channel are both under the name B. Slate Wasa. So you can find me on Facebook or subscribe to my YouTube channel. And every time I upload one of our videos, 
you will get a notification and then it's really easy to access our classes. All of our classes are recorded and then I upload them to YouTube usually within 24 hours or so. And then I put them in a playlist called SVN3E and I share that uh, videos on Facebook as well. So you can access them either through YouTube or uh, via Facebook. Also under the playlist SVN3E, there is a, sorry, supplementary video playlist as well. So all of the videos that I show in our class, so that are, I, up, I bookmark them there so that you can access them again if you'd like to, or, um, and then, or you can also find the original sources and go through that, those channels in order to access more material from those people. So it can be a good place to just touch base in terms of if you need to recap things. Science is a really visual subject, so I strongly encourage you to access the videos one way or the other. So joining me live through Zoom, even if you don't want to ask me questions or engage, but just watching what I'm doing is going to help you. I have a lot of visuals, a lot of diagrams, images, videos. So just listening to it, you don't get the full experience. If you can't li join live, which is understandable, uh, you can then watch them on YouTube. If you can't watch them on YouTube, then if you let me know, I can send you a copy of the recordings. So, but you just gotta reach out and communicate that with me so that I can set you up for success by giving you access to everything. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out and contact me. My email address is bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. My Facebook is B Slate Wasa. My phone number is 807-737-1488, extension 2209. My, you can also call toll free at 1-800-667-3703. I do now have access to my voicemail so I can give you a call back if we miss each other. Just leave me a message and your number so that I can get back to you. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Though I teach the first hour of the day and the last hour of the day. So if you miss me, then leave a message or then I will, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Right, I like to start our classes with my positionality in order to acknowledge that the way that I walk in the world and the way that I experience learning is possibly different than yours and that shapes how I teach. I have white settler ancestry. I'm a white person, I have white privilege and that definitely impacts how I have learned, how I've been treated in our education system and what I've had access to and therefore that shapes how I teach and what I think is important and what I might miss out on. So I do work hard to acknowledge that and to work beyond those confines um, in order to be making more inclusive and deeper course, but that is my reality and I can't ever a step outside of that. I will always be a white person. I will always have white privilege and that will always shape how I interact with education. I do live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people. I am working to learn from the culture around me and be as respectful as I can. I want to honor the knowledge keepers in this area and integrate that into our class as much as I can. That is a learning uh, a long learning journey. So I don't have it all figured out yet. And hopefully as I teach the course more frequently, I'll be able to improve it every time. This is my first time teaching this course. So I do have lots to learn and to unlearn. It is a long process. I don't have it all figured out. I'm sure I've made many mistakes. If anyone has any feedback, please feel free to reach out and let me know so that I can improve. Our textbook is Eurocentric. So Although I haven't come across any, I believe that there's potential for problematic language. Uh, and I have noticed definitely that it ignores Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis knowledges and experiences. Many of the examples are speaking to white uh, European-based communities or white European-based uh, sciences or science beliefs. And that just misses out on a wealth of information and knowledge that is in our world. And so in order to counter that, I work towards trying to integrate the 
information that I know about Indigenous Inuit and Métis experiences and as much knowledge as I can. Again, this is not my area of expertise and I can never truly understand. So if anyone would like to give me some feedback about how I can do better, I accept that and uh, welcome it. All right, so we are on a Thursday. We're going to do our throwback Thursday lesson today. So we are in week five, wrapping up week five. So we're halfway through our course. We've covered a lot. Um, we're going to focus on lessons 11 and thir to through 13 today, but we will like initially recap everything that we've done from lesson one. So a reminder of why we are reviewing already. Now we are halfway through the course, so it seems logical that we would be reviewing because we're getting through our information. But specifically, Herman Ebenhaus in 1885 did some research that and argued that we forget things quickly. So when we learn something, we learn it to 100%. So there's much knowledge as we can have about it. Then after one day, we've already forgot 20% of that information. We're only at 80% of retention. Then after a one week, so seven days, we're down to 40% of retention. We've lost 60% of what we knew a week ago. So if, you, if we don't go back and touch base on what the things that we have learned a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, five weeks ago, that we're going to remember very, very little of it. In addition to the, that forgetting curve research, there's been more research done that shows that if we revisit our material, the things that we're learning, not only do we remember more of it because we continue to revisit it. So we go from, in one day, we go from 100% to 80%. And then if we review it again a day later, we're back up to 100%. So we remember it more because it was easy to access. And then now it takes us two days to get down back down to 80%. It takes us longer to forget the same amount. And then if we review again, we're back up to 100%. And then it takes us three days to forget the same amount. And so we review again, and then it forgets us. It takes us four days or continued in terms of that pattern. So not only are we remembering more because we're revisiting it, we're remembering it for longer because we continue to tap into that knowledge. So I'm not saying that this is a guaranteed method to remember everything, but it is really helpful to revisit um, these subjects so that we can remember them throughout our course so we can be successful later on in the course in terms of doing your culminating, but also so you can actually carry this learning through opposed to just learning it while we are doing the course and then completely forgetting about it. Okay, so let's go over the highlights of what we have done so far. So starting with unit one, in lesson one, we talked about the components of soil, water, and air. So remembering that soil is made up of air, water, and minerals, so particularly sand, silt, and clay, as well as organic materials. Then water is a universal solvent and can uh, dissolve many substances. We also spoke about acids, bases, and the pH scale in terms of how water become more acidic or basic, and that can later we learn have impacts on the environment. And then we talk about how air is made up of various gas, particularly oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. In lesson two, we learned about the effects of human activities on soil, water, and air. So within soil, because of activities that we do, there is deforestation, urbanization, erosion, chemical fertilizers and pesticides, and industrial chemicals, and they're all destroying the soil. So we are taking healthy soil and ruining it. In terms of water, recreational, industrial, and everyday activities are constantly polluting our water. So things that we are, again, most of what many things that we do are polluting the water and having a negative impact on our environment. And thirdly, air, in terms of burning of fossil fuels, has led to air pollution and greenhouse gases, which has had detrimental effects on all living things and will continue to in terms of the climate crisis and what some folks refer to as global warming, but as the environment is changing, 
fast and we're getting warmer and warmer, that's having a really big impact on our climate and our uh, environments. Then the third lesson of unit one was common methods of sampling, monitoring of soil, water, and air. So how do we know that we're having an impact, a negative impact on soil, water, and air? We talk about how those that testing happens. So with soil, we talked about coal, uh, sorry, core soil testing, where you take a, a long tube sample out of the soil. So you get many layers. And we looked at soil profiles so that we can see the various horizons and layers of soil and how there's different impacts and different makeups of uh, materials in the different layers of soil. We talked about water and how it's sampled in testing again with a long tube that you stick in the water and it reaches down so you get multiple levels of um, the water. It isn't as easy to stay separated because it's water. Um, so they do mix it up and test it as a whole, but getting information from the close to the bottom of a water body, um, as well as close to the top, gives you more information than just doing it at the surface level. And we talked about boil ad advisories and how we're tracking that information and how many First Nation communities do not have access to clean, sanitary, healthy water, and that's a problem. And then finally, we talked about air and how we there is sac stack sampling, which is when they put a probe into factory um, smokestacks and are able to collect that samples of that air and understand what toxins are being put into the air, which related to the air quality index, which is a measure of how clean the air is and how much smog is in it and how difficult it will be to breathe or who is most likely to be affected negatively. All right, so then unit two, we moved on to talk about ecosystems. So in lesson four, we talked about cycling of substances in ecosystems. So we understood that an ecosystem is a place that where all of the organisms are working together in terms of surviving. So they uh, feed off of each other or uh, protect each other, things like that, um, and work together symbiotic symbiotically. Producers are generally plants that take sunlight and are able to change that into energy, grow, and then consumers consume either producers or consumers who consume producers. And they convert energy, that energy that initially came from the sunlight that was converted by plants now gets converted by into energy by the consumers. And then there's decomposers, which are the organisms that break down waste and dead organic material to reintroduce those nutrients back into the ground and the soil so that the producers can, or the consumers can uh, get access to them again unless they've decomposed. We talked about how these are interconnected circles, particularly with oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and how producers and consumers, one of them uses it and one of them uh, expels it to some degree, and, or deco and decomposers, how they all, in various different parts of the cycle, are engaged in these cycles where they use some of these elements and then release usually a different element that then can be used by somebody else. And we talked about biosolids in terms of humans or our activities you can think of as like ecosystems where we have producers, consumers, and decomposers. But as decomposers, we are awful. So biosolids are one way that we are trying to do better in terms of being decomposers and how we are able to learning how to utilize human waste in order to create fertilizer or um, help the growth of other things. So they potentially are really, really helpful. There are lots of, um, there's lots of information out there saying how great they are, but there are some concerns in terms of heavy metals and things that, um, toxins that might go through our systems, human systems, and end up in our waste. 
which then we are recycling back into environments and um, back into food production possibly and how that might not be the best thing. So we're, there's still lots of research to be done. It's not a fixed um, answer yet, but it is one way that humans are trying to think creatively in terms of how to lessen our impact on ecosystems. Lesson four, we talked about, sorry, lesson five, we talked about carbon footprints. So carbon footprints measure the amount of greenhouse gases emissions are produced by, could be by an individual, by a country, by an organization, by a company. We talked about how uh, it is an inequitable climate justice issue. So the white minority of the world are the people who are making the majority of the emissions. So uh, people in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, in Australia, um, places like those places are many of the white folks there are incredibly privileged and have access to a lot of energy consumption and are consuming a lot of energy and releasing a lot of emissions. This I'm not talking about individual levels, I'm talking about larger systemic issues in terms of privilege and how that uh, creates these imbalances. Whereas the global majority, which are uh, people who are not white, so Black people, Asian people, Southeast Asian people, uh, people in South America, people in Africa, people all over the world. The, these are the majority, I'm calling them, I'm referring to them as the global majority, because really in our world, there are more people who are not white than there are who are white. And that is something to acknowledge and uh, pay attention to. So the global majority are the people who are, are being impacted by these greenhouse gas emissions and climate crisis. And they're having a greater, there's a greater impact on them than there is on the white minority who are the people who are, are responsible for the emissions. So this is a really concerning issue in terms of inequity within climate, uh, within the climate crisis. And we talked about reducing carbon footprints and how the individual impact is important. Individual choices do make a difference, but it's not as much as structural change. And that we need to, if we're committed to addressing the climate crisis and thinking of seven generations in the future and making different choices about the earth, then it isn't just about us each individually turning off lights or uh, using a flows line to dry our clothes. Yes, those are good things to do, but it's about how our companies, our organizations, how much waste we create that is just excess waste like toothpaste boxes or uh, packing materials, how many things are made out of plastic, how much, um, all of these things that we consume and we use. And if we could change our societal structure in terms of not being so dependent upon those things, then we are not going to be creating as many emissions. And so again, the individual impacts are important, but really it's about who we're voting into uh, government power, who we are supporting in terms of companies and who are large companies and the choices they're making. If we spend money at these large companies, we're supporting what, how they're functioning in the world. And so that's where we need to be attacking in terms of making larger change opposed to just the small changes that we can make individually. So then we talked about lesson six, uh, which was how human activity affects ecosystems. We talked about oil spills and how they happen both on land and water. Uh, on land, they are generally leaks from pipelines and have a lesser of an impact because they're over soil. And so the, the oil soaks back into the soil fairly quickly, which means it doesn't have as much of a detrimental effect on the ecosystem because it generally comes from the soil and it isn't as easy to, uh, inf not in fact, can't think of, impact animals and plants in the area. However, in water, when oil spills happen, then the oil moves really, really quickly and so can affect a really, really wide space. 
um, really large environments. So, and then has really impacts, negative impacts on animals in terms of uh, birds or fish and mammals. Um, all of them have have impacts in terms of death, but also uh, reproductive health can shift. Um, feathers and thick coatings of animals can be impacted and therefore they can't survive in the same way. And that can ripple effect in terms of other animals being impacted, not directly by the oil spills, but indirectly because their food sources or their predators are impacted and then that uh, has a ripple effect. And then we talked about acid precipitation and how uh, this is shifts the pH level of uh, bodies of water and how that has an impact on the animals and the plants living in those bodies of water in particular. It also does have an effect on land, on forests, um, and plants and animals in, uh, off on land. But again, it has a significant impact on bodies of water because the acid precipitation increases the acidity of the bodies of water. And that means that some I can get to the point where some animals and plants uh, can't survive because the water is too acidic. And so that is, is really concerning. Then we talked about recovery and how it can take tens to 10, like decades, multiple decades for ecosystems to recover from oil spills or from consistent acid precipitation and how they're vulnerable once when they're recovering, they're vulnerable to other risks and harms. And that is really concerning, uh, again, in terms of healthy ecosystems. And then finally for unit two, we talked about invasive species for lesson seven. So we define native species, non-native species, and invasive species. So native species are species that originally are found in an area. Um, they have been there for thousands of years. Invasive species are species that humans have brought into an area either intentionally or unintentionally and are taking over that space and uh, pushing out or killing the native species. Talked about how this is monitored and how it's measured and tracked so that our researchers can tell that uh, if there's going to be a concern in an area or if there's something we can do in order to manage uh, invasive species. So then we talked about which led to controlling in terms of prevention, where we hope that we keep invasive species out of environments. If that doesn't work, then early detection and elimination. So being able to catch it early means that it is less likely to cause as much damage. Containment and management, if it's to the point where it is out of control and we are not able to eliminate it, which is most often the case. Um, being able to contain it so that it doesn't spread uh, means that it doesn't spread. And then ecosystem restoration, which is how areas that have been impact impacted by invasive species, how they can recover and what humans are doing in order to help those processes along. And then unit three. So in lesson eight of unit three, this was common environmental factors. So we started looking about uh, impacts on bodies. So first we talk about pollution, air pollution, which the five major components of air pollution are carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and particulate matter, and VOCs, which I seem to have forgotten. Um, then we talk about light pollution and how that UV radiation is impacting our skin and our bodies. We talk about noise pollution and how certain levels of sound and certain decibels means that we could go deaf um, and lose all of our hearing or part of our hearing and that could be a big shift in our lives. And then we talked about soil and water pollution again in terms of heavy metals, workplace chemicals and pathogens all being in soil and water and therefore are able to get into our systems and have an impact on us as well as other animals. So we um, are, then we talked about in lesson nine, how the environmental contaminants enter our bodies. So we first tried to understand 
how our bodies worked, and we focused on the respiratory system, digestive system, skin, and circulatory system, and how the things that we take into our body, which we need, so the air we inhale, the food and drink that we ingest, um, the things that we absorb through our skin, how all of that is broken down or processed within our bodies and the nutrients and the things that we need from that um, are circul circulated throughout our body to the areas that we need them um, through the circulatory system, through the blood. But our bodies can only defend against small amounts of contaminants. So not only does our body cycle things that we need throughout our bodies, they also cycle toxins throughout our bodies if our body comes in contact with toxins. So our bodies can deal with that to a certain degree, but they can only do so much. So if we come in contact with too much or our, um, we become sick and our system becomes dysfunctional, we lose our defenses and aren't able to deal with the contaminants as much as we may have been in the past. And then lesson 10, we talked about how our body reacts to these environmental factors. So we've talked about the environmental factors, we've talked about how our body, how they get into our body, and then we've talked about uh, what those contaminants are and how uh, we react to them, what our symptoms might be in terms of these, having these in our body, and then the diseases that are a result as well of these environmental factors and these toxins being in our body. All right, so those were the first three units that we have covered, and now we're in uh, a little bit more of unit three, um, wrapping up unit three. So we talked about how our bodies work and how we have how toxins can get into our body and the impacts. And then we, in lesson 11, we talked about how we can protect ourselves. So both medical and non-medical ways that we can protect our bodies ourselves from these environmental factors. So the medical protections that we talked about were vaccines and medicines. Vaccines, we talked about how, how a vaccine works and in terms of it being a dead or weakened state of whatever it is that we're trying to protect ourselves against. And that is injected into our body so our bodies can learn how to deal with that illness. Our bodies need to create antibodies that are like the keys to uh, bacteria and to disease so that they can fight against it. And so having the vaccination gives us a chance to our bodies to learn about those diseases and create the correct antibodies, which means that then if we come in contact with that disease again, that our body already has that information. It doesn't need to learn it again. It is able to store that information and protect ourselves. We talked about how vaccines have over the course of the years, last hundred, couple hundred years, have had a really huge impact on eradicating certain diseases um, like polio, diphtheria, um, that we don't really come in contact we don't, aren't really concerned about as much these days um, because we're vaccinated them, them our bodies are able to protect themselves and that is really really quite amazing in terms of that medical advancement and we talked about medicines and how our bodies process medicines and how yeah really just how our bodies process medicines if there's not a vaccination that is available um, and that different things are working different ways. But we talked about how this is very similar to how our body process toxins or just the things that we need. They also process uh, medicine in the same way. And that generally is transferred to our body to where it needs to be through the circulatory system. And we talked about non-medical protections that are maybe manageable and easy for us to, or accessible. Um, sunscreen and sun protective clothing. So we talked about the different ways of measuring sunscreen and sun protective clothing. So SPF for sunscreen and UPF for sun protective clothing and how sunscreen is generally doesn't, isn't as effective as sun protective clothing. It doesn't last as long because it washes off. It needs to be reapplied. It doesn't necessarily always get applied properly. Um, and it doesn't necessarily reflect as much of the UV rays as sun protective clothing does. Um, but some folks prefer it over sun protective clothing, which generally reflects more UV rays and is better coverage and is less likely to get a sunburn or to develop skin cancer. 
Then we talked about respirators and there were two types that I don't remember off the top of my head um, what they are called, but they are set up in different ways in terms of one just filters the air so that you're not breathing in toxins, whereas the other one is giving you uh, supplies you with air and those ones are in more hazardous situations so that you can breathe in extremely hazardous environments um, like burning buildings and you don't have to worry about your filter getting clogged or not being able to breathe. And then we talked about hearing protection in terms of uh, earmuffs and earplugs and how they are both effective in, in different ways and there's conveniences of both um, and challenges of both that they can be used together in order to maximize your protection. And then we talked about uh, personal hygiene and household cleaners in lesson 12. So we focused on hand washing and soap and water needed for at least 20 seconds. And we talked about why we looked at some images and diagrams about how bacteria thrives in environments and how your hands are clean, but really are covered in bacteria. And so that 20 seconds of soap and water really makes a huge, incredible difference. Particularly needing to wash between your fingers, under your nails, uh, the backs of your hands up to your wrists and the front as well. And how doing it properly really makes, an, like is the best way to deal with infectious diseases. Then we talked about food safety and how there's over 11,500 hospitalizations and 240 deaths per year related to foodborne illnesses. And so this is something that hopefully we can prevent more and more because of just being careful, both in terms of production of our food, but also being careful at home so that people don't get food poisoning and get really sick. This, the little statement that came up over and over again for food safety is the clean, separate, cook and chill. So making sure your hands, workspaces, and utensils are all very clean, making sure your food is separate uh, in terms of your raw food it is separate from your fruits and vegetables or your cooked food is separate from your raw food. Cooking everything to a proper temperature, internal temperature so that it is truly cooked and any bacteria is potentially killed is, is killed. Um, there are various lists out there in the world that you can find what the proper temperature is and you can get a digital thermometer so you can check the temperature of your particular but also leftovers and things like that. And then chill that either when you were bringing things home from the grocery store or from wherever you're getting it um, or after you are have cooked it for a meal that it is chilled within two hours because bacteria is in its happy place between uh, at, at around room temperature. Um, so like between four degrees, which is the temperature of a fridge up to like 30 degrees or something is, is the time that it really wants to grow and be happy. So it's best to chill your food as fast as you can. And then separately, we talked about indoor air quality and how the air inside buildings is two to five times more polluted than the air outside of buildings because it's generally stagnant and trapped. Um, and so there's biological and chemical factors that grow and impact the our air inside. So things like dust mites and mold, and then uh, off gassing of various chemicals that are just normal chemicals or normal products in your home. So it's not that it's heavy due to things, it's just that all of these things have gases that are then trapped in your home. So we're all breathing this in and that's making an impact, making a lot of more people have asthma or allergies and having a hard time breathing. So we can prevent it, we can work towards prevention, particularly with source control. So controlling it at the source um, and making sure things are clean, making sure that things are dry and uh, using products that have less chemicals than others. And then the second method is ventilation. So making sure that our areas are aired out so that one, they stay dry, but also air is cycled through and not as stagnant. And finally, air cleaning is an option, though it is not as effective as source control or ventilation. So it is sort of a backup last line of defense. 
um, where machines attempt to clean out the particles, the chemicals and such in your air, though it's not as effective as we would hope. And then we moved on to unit four. So unit four, we're looking on starting with lesson 13, we're looking at non-renewable and renewable energy sources. So the non-renewable energy sources um, that we talked about were the fossil fuels that we depend upon and but are also rapidly depleting. So we're going to soon be out of them. This is coal, crude oil, natural gas, and nuclear power. And then we looked at renewable energy sources and the various different ways that we can have energy from sources that we won't deplete and uh, how they function and how we could utilize them. So those were hydroelectric, so water power, solar, power from the sun, wind, power generated from capturing the movement of the wind, uh, tidal, energy emitted by capturing the movement of tides, geothermal, where you tap into the geothermal reservoirs deep, deep, deep inside the earth and access the heat there. Biomass, where you turn organic waste into fuel or heat and are able to generate other sources of fuel or uh, electricity. And then hydrogen fuel cells, which are a newer technology that is not super widespread, but can create electricity um, and can be used in some environments. And that is what we covered so far. So that is like so much we've covered so, so much already. And we are just over halfway through the course. We have, that was 13 lessons and I believe we have 23 lessons. So we have 10 more new material lessons to go, um, but that is just a significant amount of material to remember. For the last few minutes of our day today, we're going to uh, briefly look over the key questions of those last three lessons, um, starting at lesson 11. So these are page, sorry, the tech for understanding questions on page 88, uh, one and two, where they talk. So the first one is how is a vaccine different from medication when treating a disease? So talking about how vaccines are prevention, whereas medication is generally responsive or uh, in the absence of a vaccine. And then what do vaccines protect the body from. So you can think of the various things that we talked about in terms of uh, what vaccines we use and are effective so far. Then on page 91, check your understanding one and two. Uh, asthma is becoming more and more common in younger Canadians. What are three triggers that cause an asthma attack? I don't actually know that off the top of my head. Uh, we didn't talk about that in our lesson, but I'm sure it is either in your workbook or something that is fairly easy to research and look up. Describe the three ways to protect yourself from environmental factors related to the sun. So that's thinking about sunscreen, sun protection, and what you can do. So give me a little bit more than just saying sunscreen and sun protection. How does those actually protect your, your body? And then the review questions on page 93, one through 13. So what evidence is provided in figure 324 that vaccines can reduce the rate of diseases like diphtheria and whooping cough? So we talked about those graphs in our lesson and how they are showing that these diseases are not as rampant as they once were. When was the last case of polio reported in Canada? Again, I don't know that off the top of my head. Either it's in your workbook and you can look it up or something that you can research. Again, most likely fairly straightforwardly. Why are booster shots needed for some vaccines? So booster shots, uh, like for example, the COVID-19 booster shot, um, you, if you've had it, then you've gone for one shot, for your initial shot, and then uh, a few months later, you need to go back and uh, boost it. So in, help the vaccine, help your body to really understand the, the disease and create the antibodies really, really well. Um, so that's why you have booster shot is to support your body into learning these diseases. Okay, I'm going to continue. We're going to acquire community, community versus artificial acquired immunity. We talked a little bit about and is definitely in your book. Um, we talked about malaria in terms of medications. 
talked about what the SPF number of sunscreen represents. So we talked about SPF 15 in particular. And we didn't talk about the clothing with high UPF ratings tend to have what characteristics. Um, so that'd be something that'd be interesting to look into, that you need to look into a little bit more. Um, I didn't cover that one specifically. Describe a situation where a person would require a respirator. So when would they need their breathing to protect it? So either through filtering um, the respirator that filters or the respirator that uh, bring that gives you fresh air. Here's the air purifying respirator and supplied air purifier. Those are the two kinds of respirators. And then what are the two devices that will assist in reducing the impact of noise pollution on human hearing? We talked about those two devices. There were two that we talked about. You should be able to figure them out. And on a separate sheet of paper, illustrate a po in a poster or other graphic the advantages and disadvantages of using earplugs and earmuffs. It's almost like they answer the question in 13 that they're asking in 12. All right, so then in lesson 12 on page 98, questions one and two, how does a person contract a foodborne illness. So how do we intake those uh, contaminants from our food and get sick? And what, when considering safe food practices, what four categories of action should always be considered? So again, we went over them a gazillion times in our lesson and we went over them again today. So there are four things, four words that we thought of um, to promote safe food practices. Three questions for lesson 12 on page 101. If you were babysitting a child for a day during the summer holidays, describe four situations where you would get them to wash their hands. Um, basically, what are four situations that you need to wash your hands? Is there a difference between regular soap and antibacterial soap? Um, talked about this in class a little bit in the video. He spoke to it in terms of if you need to use one or the other if one of them is better than the other. List good hygiene practices you're doing or could be doing with very little change to your regular lifestyle. So this is personal. What are things that you do well and what are things that without having to do huge changes, you probably could do better. Why should a refrigerator always be below four degrees Celsius? We talked briefly about when bacteria is happiest and how that might have an impact if they're in the fridge. Um, ways that we can improve indoor air quality. We talked about this in our lesson in terms of some strategies about uh, ventilation and cleanliness. Some examples of how to have increased ventilation and why air cleaners are not as strong as other improving indoor air quality methods. So then finally, lesson 13. Page 104, to find a non-renewable energy source and give an example. We talked lots about that. You should be able to do that. Describe two methods of extracting coal from the ground. Again, we talked about in class, the different forms of mining for coal. Then page 105, to check your understanding questions. Name three products produced from crude oil. And what is the fuel used in nuclear power plants? So those are things that directly you can take out of the workbook or our lesson. And the review questions on 109, one through seven. So why are some energy sources called alternative sources? I didn't say this explicitly in our lesson, but it is in the workbook. Uh, and what is the role of steam in producing electricity from a power plant? So many of our methods uh, use steam to create electricity. Um, it's just a matter of what kind of, play, what kind of energy source creates that heat. So hopefully you're comfortable with answering that because we talked about it a lot. If, what method of solar power would you use to, for the following situations? So thinking about, um, we have, remember those, there were four different ways that we can use solar power. Um, so some of them are better fitted than others. Talking about geothermal and how it's used to heat and cool buildings in Ontario. And Fermentation in terms of how that creates biofuels. We talked about that as well. And listing three fuel cells, 
I would assume that that would be under the hydrofuel cell section of uh, the lesson. So that is a quick review. Again, always these are quick reviews to just remind us what we have been talking about. They are not extensive, they are not in depth. That is why we have our previous lessons, which you can still access all on YouTube. So go and check those things out if anything doesn't sound familiar or maybe you missed something. Um, but it's good to remind everything that we've done so that in a few weeks as we're coming up to wrap our end of our, co our course, we really have learned what it is that we are um, supposed to learn. If you have any questions or want to talk about anything, please reach out. The number at the office is 807-737-1488, extension 2209. You can also call toll free at 1-800-667-3703. You can email me at bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. You can connect with me on Facebook at B Slate Wassa. And again, our YouTube channel is B Slate Wassa, where you can find the playlist of SVN 3E of all of our uh, materials, all of our lessons, and all of our supplementary materials. I hope you have a lovely day. Thanks so much for joining me. Bewitch.